Hi, today I want to talk to you about an amazing book called The Bible. Today, over 129 million books have been published in the world. Of these, the Holy Bible ranks number one in the top 10 most read books in the past 50 years. It has been translated into 531 languages, while 2800 languages have at least a portion of the Bible available to readers. The Bible is a collection of books whose unmistakable author is God. It is comprised of 66 books written by nearly 40 different writers during a period of approximately 1600 years. 39 of these books constitute what is known as the Old Testament and 27 are included in the New Testament. The Old Testament has three major sections. The Law of Moses refers to the first five books of the Bible. They cover creation, Exodus, Ten Commandments, also known as the Moral Law. The Prophets refer to all the prophetic books that describe prophecies of the past and future. And Psalms, which is a collection of poetic hymns that describe God's majesty, justice and mercy. Many critics have claimed that the Bible is only a book written by ordinary men and therefore there is no different than any other book. While the first part is partly true, the later is false. Men may have written the book, but they were not ordinary. They were uniquely endowed and characterized as holy men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The scripture also tells us of God and His loving character. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me, Jesus Christ said. The Bible points us to see ourselves as we truly are. It has sanctified power to mold and preserve mankind in its condition, something we can't do for ourselves. It can transform our character. The only way we can accomplish this is by knowing Him. I am the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ said. The central theme of the Bible is Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, who left us the Bible so that by studying it, we can gain a personal relationship with Him and ultimately receive salvation. David wrote, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and light for my path. He understood the value of the Word of God and its manifold benefits. In the midst of all the turmoil and strife of this present age, the Bible stands as an immovable, unchangeable beacon, its light pointing to heaven. It is a teacher and a counselor of the highest order. Today, we still have an opportunity to better acquaint ourselves with the Word of God. There is still time to become familiarized with God's plan for us. So. Let's make use of this valuable gift. Today, I want to talk to you about the origin of evil. Can we know the origin of evil? Does the presence of evil in this world really negate the existence of God? Is it possible to accommodate both the existence of God and the existence of evil within a coherent explanation of life? There could hardly be more fundamental and perplexing questions. Our world is preoccupied with the issue of origins. To find the truth about origins, we must go to the Bible. God is perfect, and everything He made was perfect. In the Bible, we read of a time when evil did not exist. The perfect peace and harmony reigned and happiness pervaded the universe. Of all created beings, the angels were the most intelligent and possessed great beauty and strength. One angel stood out in wisdom and beauty. He the most beautiful and wisest of all created beings once bore the name Lucifer, son of the morning, which means day star. This unique angel in heaven first cherished sin. Though all his glory was from God, Lucifer came to regard as pertaining to himself. Not satisfied with his present position, he ventured to covet the homage due to the Creator. Instead of seeking to make God supreme in the affections of all created beings, he endeavored to secure their service and loyalty to himself, thus inducing them to rebel against God and his law. Lucifer's pride was the origin of all evil. For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. This angel's rebellion was both deceptive and contrary to the natural laws of heaven. 
two opposing principles, righteousness and iniquity, cannot exist together. And thus the rebellion of Satan culminated in a spiritual war in heaven. Christ commanded the loyal angels and was victorious over Satan and his host. Satan charged upon the government of God that discord his own course has caused in heaven. He declared all evil to be the result of the divine administration. He claimed that it was the object to improve the law of God. Therefore, God permitted him to demonstrate the nature of his claims, to show the consequences of his purposed changes in the divine law. His own work was permitted to condemn him, because Satan claimed from his first that he was not in rebellion, the whole universe must see the deceiver unmasked. The good news for us today is that the end of sin and all evil is at hand. It will be destroyed in the most effective way and will never more raise its ugly head. Satan, the root of sin, and his followers, like its branches, will be eternally destroyed. It is very important for us to recognize that evil is not simply a type of behavior. In fact, Evil becomes a motivating force behind a behavior when it is a function of intent. It is easy for us to judge behavior that is destructive, cruel, or immoral as being evil. But behavior that outwardly seems to produce much good can still be considered evil in God's sight unless it's undertaken in submission to Him for the purpose of glorifying Him. The end does not justify the means with God. Motives must be pure to make actions pure. It is the motive that fuels our behavior that really counts, no matter how good the result looks to us or to others. So, evil is a spiritual power, a motivating force that it began with a choice. It originated when a created being demanded to be treated as if he was the creator, and it went downhill from there. The consequences of that choice are suffered by each one of us every day. It took the death of God's own Son to reverse its effect on us, and then only if we choose to allow it. Knowing the origin of evil and its consequences, it leaves a pivotal question. What choices will each one of us make in life? If given a moment to reflect, science, business, and industry would doubtless give a standing ovation for the development of the computer. Its invention has revolutionized our society, and each one of us, directly or indirectly, receives the benefit it brings. But, have you ever stopped to consider what goes inside this marvelous piece of machinery? Now, suppose a prominent computer scientist made a statement that over a period of billion of years, computer evolved into what we can buy today at our local computer store. You'll say that he's crazy. Yet we are taught to believe that the universe and all that exists and lives came into existence by chance, or as some evolutionists call it, by accident. Or the Big Bang. Yes, accidents do happen. But have you noticed that they are result is confusion. The human body contains mysteries which science is yet to explain. The building block of life is the simple cell. Yet just as complicated as a computer has a designer and maker, anyone who intelligently observes the wonders of nature will come to the conclusion that there must be a designer and maker infinitely more intelligent than man. So, how did all things originate? Where did I come from? The Bible, our textbook, gives the only satisfactory answer to these questions. He who qualifies for the title of Creator must have existed before anything that was created. God is eternal, immortal, and full of wisdom. He alone can be the Creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It becomes apparent that God, as well as the Son of God, created the words. The Son was the agent cooperating in the Father's plan. The Son of God, he who later took the form of man, coming down from heaven to this world, as Jesus Christ was the Word, or our Creator. When we want to make something, let's say, a phone, we need raw material, such as plastic, glass, alloy, whatever else it may be. All materials of which this world is made were generated and brought into existence by the Word of God. The earth was created in six literal days, which together with the seventh day from the first week. Science still does not have a plausible explanation of creation and the existence of a weekly cycle other than as ordained in the beginning. Day one, God created day and night. Day two, God created heaven and called it the sky. Day three, God created the ground, land, and he created waters, the seas, and vegetation, plants and trees. Day four, 
God created the sun, moon, and the stars. Day 5, God created every living creature of the sea and every winged bird. Day 6, God created the animals to fill the earth. And on the sixth day, God also created Adam and Eve in His own image to commune with them. On the seventh day, God had finished His work of creation and rested and blessed it and made it holy. So, you and I did not evolve from germs, mollusks, and apes as scientists would have us believe. God created man in His own image. Human body and nature testify of God and His power. Today, He is still creating, but this work of creation is on the inside. It is in our heart. We need to let Him in and He will do marvelous things in our life. If you like this video and you want to see more videos like this, please show us your support by hitting the like button below, by sharing and commenting. And don't forget to subscribe. Today we'll talk about the downfall of man. Why is there suffering, sadness, war and death? Why is it common for us to hear about earthquakes, tornadoes and plane crashes? God created the world and everything in it. But did He create the world as it is now? Was it His purpose that suffering, sadness and death should exist? If not, when and how did they originate? To find their origin, we must remind ourselves about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve lived in a paradise which was called the Garden of Eden. They had a happy home and joy in their surroundings. They could enjoy the presence of the Creator and talk to Him face to face. No shadow of unhappiness existed in paradise. Angels of heaven came down to visit Adam and Eve and told them about God's love and goodness. In every leaf, in every flower, in every stone, God's care and love could be seen. But God gave Adam and Eve a command, the command of faithfulness. When angels of heaven visited the inhabitants of the Garden of Eden, they explained how one angel of heaven had rebelled against God and His law. We talked about that in our previous episode titled, The Origin of Evil. They warned them not to listen to the tempter and told Adam and Eve to obey God's commandment without questioning. Adam and Eve had plenty of proof that God loved and cared for them. But God wanted to test them by placing a restriction on them. What was the restriction? Two special trees grew in the middle of the garden. One was the tree of life, which gave and continued life. The other one was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis chapter 2 verse 17 says, but of the tree of knowledge, of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou shalt eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. This tree of knowledge of good and evil was not to be touched. It was not the will of God that man should know evil. He had provided them with everything that was good, but in love withheld from them the knowledge of evil. Adam and Eve were placed upon probation. The tree of knowledge was just a simple test of their obedience and love to God. They could maintain immortality only if they were loyal to God. After Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't die immediately. But they had to face the result of sin. And that is the same with us today. The result of Adam and Eve's sin is why we still have sadness, suffering and terrorism today. But let me tell you the encouraging part of the story. Although man sinned, God made a promise to each and every one of us that is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. That promise was already partially fulfilled when Jesus came and died for us. He bruised the serpent's head. God did not leave Adam and Eve without hope. The plan of redemption was offered to them, but that same plan of redemption is still offered to everyone who accepts Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Will you accept Him today? Today, we will be discussing about the plan of restoration. After God created the earth to be man's eternal home, He forewarned our first parents that their continued life depended upon their obedience to His law. They disobeyed and were sentenced to death. By heredity, this death condemnation was passed on and the human family has experienced more than 6,000 years of sin, sickness, and death. Once the law was broken by Adam and Eve, the requirement was that the sinner must die. But God did not leave Adam and Eve without any hope. A wonderful plan was to save man. It was impossible for God to pardon the guilty. However, God's mercy and love could not let man die without hope of having eternal life again. How was this possible? Do you remember the promise of Genesis 3.15 that we talked about last time? 
God guarantees victory over sin. Through God's sacrifice, Adam and his race would be delivered from Satan's rulership. This means that the original purpose of God in the creation of man will be fulfilled and the earth will become one vast paradise populated by the redeemed and restored offspring of Adam and Eve. What is the essence of salvation? And you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This is the essence of the plan of salvation. The penalty for sin, which is death, had to be paid. A substitute had to take the place of man in order to secure his salvation. The Son of God, who created man, offered himself as the sacrifice for the guilty race. No one except our Creator could pay the price for our salvation. Since all have sinned, and we know that the wages of sin is death, that means that no one stands a chance against the sin and we all have to pay the penalty. However, God loves us so much, He didn't let that happen. John chapter 3 and verse 16 is a proof of that. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have an everlasting life. What was the price of our redemption? Christ was physically exhausted, beaten, nailed to the cross, but He didn't die from any of these things. He was killed by sin, my sin. The innocent Lamb of God was tortured to death. Dear friends, that is the price He paid for you, so you might live. He took your place on the cross and died for you. But today Jesus is alive. He not only created us, He died and shed His blood, so that we could be saved. We belong to Him because He is our Creator and Redeemer. Was all His suffering in vain? Jesus was willing to pay the price of our salvation with His own blood so you and I could live. What are you willing to do for Jesus today? Are you willing to give Him your heart?